Uh, good evening, everybody, and thank you for joining us this evening for the third in a series of webinars which have been organized by the Health Sector Anti-Corruption Forum, which is a partnership between statutory bodies and uh, also civil society uh, interested in combating corruption in the health sector uh, partic in particular. The purpose of these webinars is to uh, elicit debate uh, about health sector corruption, but also to help us to combat health sector corruption. And uh, each one of these debates is looking at a different area or angle of corruption within our health sector. And this evening's uh, discussion is going to look specifically at the question of corruption in the private uh, healthcare sector. Um, for that purpose, I'm very uh, glad uh, and grateful that this evening we are joined by uh, two people who know as much as anybody else about what's going on uh, and what we should be doing about it. Uh, and I'll introduce them uh, just briefly. The first uh, person to introduce is Mapato Ramahopa. Uh, good evening, Mapato. Uh, Mapato is an economist by trade. Uh, she's also the manager in the Office of the Competition Commissioner. And a couple of years ago, she was the director uh, of the health market inquiry uh, into the private healthcare sector run by the Competition Commission. So, of course, I think she has a very granular and in detail understanding of our private healthcare sector. Uh, we're also joined by Dr. Katlejo Motudi. Uh, he's in the middle of my screen. I'm not sure where he is on yours. Uh, uh, Dr. Matudi, thank you very much uh, for being with us. Uh, Dr. Matudi is a medical doctor. Uh, he's worked in the health sector for 25 years, uh, starting out as a uh, practicing uh, doctor, um, but latterly for the last 14 years has been uh, working in the medical aid scheme uh, industry. Uh, thank you very much for being with us, uh, Dr. Uh, um, uh, Matudi. He's here today in his capacity as the director, uh, the managing director of the Board of, of Healthcare Funders. Uh, we were also hoping this evening to be joined by Dr. Sipo Kabani from the Council for Medical Schemes. Uh, unfortunately, Dr. Kabani is not well, so is unable to join us. Uh, but Dr. Matudi told me a few minutes ago uh, that even though he's not uh, entitled to speak for the Council for Medical Schemes, he is a member of one of its important committees uh, on fraud, risk and abuse, and uh, so may be able to shed some light on that aspect as well. So thank you. And finally, my name is Mark Hayward. I'm the editor of Maverick Citizen. I'm the facilitator of uh, tonight's discussion, and uh, hopefully uh, I'll help us to get the most out of this, this opportunity. now. Just before we begin a uh, uh, conversation with my guests, I just want to say this. The reason that we had a discussion or we're having a discussion on corruption in the private healthcare sector is because we talk a lot about corruption, but we talk about corruption often as if the problem is purely limited to public servants and to politicians, to the public uh, sector. And yet we know in South Africa that we have a divided health system. We have a private healthcare sector, we have a public healthcare sector. Although the public healthcare sector caters for many, many more people, 83% of our population, the private and public healthcare sector spend roughly the same amounts of money per annum. And that is hundreds of billions of rands go through the private uh, healthcare sector. So it's a sector that is just as vulnerable to fraud and corruption as the public healthcare sector. And in fact, those of you who were with us uh, a couple of weeks ago when we were with Dr. Nicholas Crisp, uh, you know, Dr. Crisp did some research eight years ago into corruption in the healthcare sector, and he found that corruption was more or less equal in the public and private healthcare sectors. And at that point, eight years ago, was estimated to cost in the private sector 20 billion rand a year. So we're talking big uh, money. And the last thing I want to say 
uh, by way of introduction is just to dispel the myth that uh, the private healthcare sector, that perhaps people in the private healthcare sector can, can afford the cost of, uh, of, of corruption because they're employed, because they're, they're better off. Uh, it's true that many better off people use the private healthcare sector, but it's also true that poor people, working class people, spend billions of rands a year as members of medical aid schemes and on out of pocket uh, purchases. So private health sector corruption is as bad, as damaging, as dangerous as what we most commonly talk about when we talk about the, the, the public health care sector. So let that set the scene uh, for, the, for, for this evening's discussion. And I want to start uh, with Dr. Matudi, as I said, the managing director of the Board of Healthcare Funders. Dr. Matudi, can you just start by, first of all, I'm not sure that everybody here knows what the Board of Healthcare Funders is. Uh, but secondly, once you've done that, could you tell us, is it a problem? Isn't it a problem? Do you see it? Uh, um, just kick us off uh, uh, that way, and then we'll, we'll come to uh, uh, Mapato after, after, you, after you. Thank you. Okay. Thank you very much, uh, Mark. Um, and I want to first thank the SIU uh, for this opportunity. I think it's important that uh, in our fight against corruption and fraud, uh, we get as many people to know uh, what is happening uh, because that will augur well in terms of uh, disseminating information, but also getting people to start reporting whatever um, uh, fraud and corruption they actually uh, come against. Um, I work for the Board of Healthcare Funders, which is an association for health funders. Uh, ordinarily, that includes medical aid schemes and their partner organizations in the name of managed care organizations, as well as administrators. Um, we help these organizations to articulate uh, healthcare policy through lobbying and advocacy um, where in the entities that they are registered in. That is through uh, the regulators and the policy makers and, and governments. And this happens in the eight countries that we are active in. Uh, in South Africa, we just have about um, uh, half of the uh, market share um, and also we have now started partnerships not just in the private sector but with state agents, agencies which includes compensation fund as well as uh, the, Dr. Uh, Matudi, I'm not sure yeah. if it's just me I don't yeah. know if you need to speak a little bit closer because to the mic, I, yeah. I, you're coming a little bit distorted and, and you've got important okay. things to say and I'd like people to hear okay. them okay. <laughs> let, me, let me bring the mic, is it better now? I'll, That's better, yeah. I'll bring them. Okay, yeah. So as I was uh, uh, concluding, my last uh, sentence there was that we're not just active in the private sector, but we've got partnerships with state agencies, which includes your road accident fund and the compensation fund. And this is with a view of what we were saying earlier about although that the private sector service is a small component of uh, people on paper, quite a number of people actually access healthcare. And when you come to issues of corruption and fraud, there are really no borders. In as much as we are going to talk a lot today about corruption in the private sector, you will see that it actually uh, makes forays uh, across um, uh, the, the, the lines and, and you have involvement of, of state. Now, as the Board of Healthcare Funders, one of our um, uh, functions is to make sure that the industry is sustainable. Um, and that talks to issues of affordability. So you cannot talk about sustainability without looking at what causes inefficiencies in a system. And some of those are caused by fraud and what we call waste and abuse. Uh, some people would, would refer to that as, as corruption as well. So what we have done uh, as the Board of Healthcare Funders, we've been very deliberate about our approach uh, to this. And to that extent, we have established a, a unit um, in the early 2000s called the Health Forensic Management Unit. And what it does, it forces entities that are working in our space to collaborate and share information and also uh, train one another to make sure that they are aware of the trends and also help them establish forensic units in their own backyards to make sure that they, uh, they have uh, awareness um, as far as fraud and 
corruption. And I think maybe, Mark, and I know we'll, we'll, we'll talk a bit more about these things, it's important also to establish what we are talking about because some of these terms, we talk about them, what is corruption, what is fraud, etc. And then just simply, when we talk about corruption, for me, there are two elements. Uh, there is an element of uh, dishonesty or fraudulent behavior. The second part is that of power. And it can be power in terms of your position that you hold or because of you have control. So if you have somebody uh, who is maybe engaging in a bribery uh, incident, for example, they need to be able to effect whatever it is the, the briber needs to, uh, needs to have uh, happen. Now, fraud, um, there is a legal definition of fraud, and then there are several elements of that. The first one is that there is intention to deceive. The second aspect is that there is prejudice um, uh, and there is financial or other gain by whoever is engaged in a fraudulent behavior. And it is a, a criminal uh, offense. We have decided to clump it with what we call waste and abuse, simply because these are elements that eat into- I'm Holding your is, microphone up. <laughs> yeah. So these are elements that eat into the resources uh, that we, we, we have. So waste, for example, although there is no intention uh, or, or criminal element, uh, there is excess or there, there, there is excessive uh, utilization of whatever health service that is uh, uh, in concern. Abuse, on the other hand, is somebody who just goes against uh, ordinary protocol. So they would then give what is inappropriate. And I think it's important to uh, understand those. So what is, the, what, what is the impact and why are we talking about it? If you look at a, um, a publication from the University of Portsmouth uh, in the UK, they have from 2009 published uh, articles that talk about the financial cost of fraud. And they look at fraud across all areas. And what they say is that it does not matter what organization you are in or what sector you are in. Fraud affects all of us. And minimally, and if you've got very good controls, uh, you will suffer about 3% losses from your revenues, but it can stretch all the way up to 10%. And if you work in the abuse and wastage element, it can go up to 15 or even 20% if you've got no controls at all. But the running average is now at about 7%, but that has seen an increase uh, of almost 60% if you look at the 20 years since they started measuring it. So it has moved from around 4%, 4, 4, 4, 4 and it's now at 7%. So what it says is that Although we are getting better at detection and we've got uh, forensic units and training people, fraud is on the increase and it does not choose which uh, uh, organization uh, or sector that you are in. Now, to come back to the private sector and specifically the medical aid sector, we have roughly a 200 billion a year uh, um, uh, operation. What it means is that if you are looking at about 6%, uh, uh, it's about 12 million rent of fraud if you add the fraud the, the waste and abuse it can go up to 30 uh, 35 billion and i think it's very much in line with, with the figures that you are quoting that dr chris was talking about that it was about 20 billion rent uh, um, uh, about 20 years ago now this is just the medical aid sector and that is not the expanse uh, of um, the the private sector um, uh, what it means is that every organization that deems itself to be operating in this thing can estimate that it's losing at least 3% on an annual basis. Um, um, and Mark, I'm going to stop here uh, and then we can develop some of these thoughts uh, uh, during the discussion. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Matudi, and thanks also for being very concrete. I mean, the thing that strikes me from what you say is that at a time when we are so resource constrained, particularly in the healthcare sector, you've confirmed that there are very large amounts of money that are, are being lost to corruption. And I guess I'm not going to ask you this now, but think on it. My, my next question would be, well, if you know that, that perhaps 7% of medical aid schemes uh, 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 revenue or expenditure is lost to fraud, what are you doing to identify it proactively and to, to, to get that figure 
uh, down. But maybe we'll come back to that uh, a little bit later. The other thing that went through my head as I was listening to you is, you know, where are the where where are we setting examples? I haven't seen reports splashed across newspapers about the crooks in the private healthcare sector who've been caught out and shamed and who are perhaps being prosecuted uh, at this at, at this moment in time. Maybe there are some examples, but but uh, uh, let's just move quickly now to Mapato. Mapato, I know the Competition Commission isn't a, a health organization per se. It's not a state in, well, it is an investigative agency in many ways, but can you tell us a little bit about your engagement with the private healthcare sector and what you've seen? And I know also that Competition Commission has played quite an important part investigating COVID-19 related uh, uh, issues that could well be described as corruption. Uh, over to you, uh, Mapato. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Mark. And I just want to extend uh, uh, my gratitude to the SIU for organizing this uh, important discussion. So I would just mention as an introduction that uh, Competition Act is one of the transformative uh, legislations that was enabled by the new democratic dispensation. The purpose really was just to ensure that there's greater diversity in the markets, there's greater spread of ownership, and there's greater competition. Because with that, then you would have, um, you know, competitive prices in the market, access to innovative products and services, high quality, uh, and the like. So, in the context of healthcare, we believe that competition policy also has a crucial role to play. I mean, firstly, in terms of delivering access to healthcare, um, allowing access to innovative products services at competitive prices and quality, but also in the context of the pandemic, uh, we believe that competition policy has a role um, just in terms of minimizing the impact brought about uh, uh, COVID-19. So we use the Competition Act actually to undertake a much- Napata, I think you may also need to speak just a little bit closer because I'm also getting a bit of distortion with you. Okay, is, is it better now? So continue. All right, okay. Sorry about that. So um, I mentioned that uh, in 2014, we uh, conducted a market inquiry um, in the private healthcare sector. And the reason why this market inquiry was established was that we were observing a very high cost of healthcare. They were, you know, at outstripping inflation at the time. So as well, we were getting a lot of complaints from stakeholders um, around a certain uh, conduct uh, in the private healthcare sector. So in that regard, we instituted a market inquiry. We focused on four key areas, uh, which is medical schemes, hospitals, providers, by providers I mean uh, practitioners and, and, and uh, specialists, you know, your GPs. But we also focus on the current regulatory framework that governs the, the private health uh, sector. We were interested in the incentives that drive market behavior and just, you know, what reward or punishment mechanisms make stakeholders behave the way they do in the market. And then what recommendations could be made, uh, you know, just to try and change those incentives. But in terms of our findings, um, uh, generally we found that there's a significant uh, a high cost uh, and rising cost of healthcare. We spend about 4% of the total health spend of the country in the private sector. And that, that same, 4% is also spent in the private in the public sector which covers you know 83% of, of 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 the population but we also found that there's um high concentration and market power both on the supply and the demand side so by market power, and I think uh, uh, Dr. Mutudi mentioned something about power dynamics. Market power is, you know, the ability to behave uh, independent of the market, independent of consumers, because if you exercise market power in a functioning market, consumers would exercise their choice and move to, you know, to other competing firms or other services uh, that could be uh, maybe cheaper. So we found that there's a, a significant market power that leads to a lot of inefficiencies in the private health care sector. But another thing that we picked up was that uh, for medical schemes, over time we see a decline in benefits despite, uh, you know, increasing uh, medical premiums and also a significant level of out-of-pocket payment. Uh, most benefits get depleted, you know, 
towards the half of the year. And then that means that despite paying for medical scheme uh, premiums, you still have to pay out of pocket. And also, I mean, even if you have cover, you find that there are limitations and certain uh, services you'd have to pay for them out of pocket. But also we found that there are certain structures in the market that enable uh, inefficiencies, particularly around pricing. So this, the, the private sector is characterized by fee for service uh, uh, remuneration uh, uh, mechanisms. And that means that providers charge for every service that they provide. So there is no bundling of services that could you know, allow for risk sharing uh, mechanisms. So this is part of the problem, but also fragmented billing uh, codes uh, that are not updated. Every provider or every you know, a, a, a service provider in the system uses their own uh, 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 billing codes. So those are the things that sort of uh, cause a, a, a lot of inefficiencies. Um, there's also significant uh, overutilization of um, uh, services, so more resources are used than what is necessary. Uh, we benchmarked ourselves against OECD countries. For instance, our hospital admission rates are very high, and I mean, there, there's no documented improvement in health outcomes. So these are some of the things that we picked up uh, as, as, as drivers of costs and uh, inefficiencies in the private uh, health sector. So generally, we found that the incentives in the in this market are failing uh, uh, consumers. So you know, the consumers are really not getting value for money. We made several uh, uh, recommendations, uh, but maybe we'll discuss that a bit later on, uh, just to try and uh, reform the, the private sector. But we wanted to focus particularly on the pricing, the lack of proper price price determination mechanism, uh, and, and, and also just issues around uh, developing innovative healthcare models that will enable a value for, for, for money. But I also want to mention our interventions recently um, uh, during the, the pandemic where the DTIC in March uh, published a set of block exemptions um, that were aimed at promoting coordination in the private sector, but also with the public sector. So I think there was recognition that, you know, in, in the context of a, a pandemic, you, you, you don't necessarily want, you know, normal competition to occur, but you can allow the sectors to coordinate just to ensure there is, you know, sufficient sharing of information. Uh, you know, we facilitated a cost reduction measures such as cost of uh, the, the diagnostic, the diagnostic test, uh, you know, treatment and other preventative uh, uh, interventions. So we sought to say to the private sector, you can collaborate on certain aspects so that you are able to assist in responding to the pandemic. So there were several areas of success um, with that block exemption. But, uh, you know, one thing that truly disappointed us uh, in particular, we had several pieces of excessive pricing and price gouging of essential products and services uh, that are meant to respond to the pandemic, such as uh, masks, sanitizers, but as well as uh, PPEs. Um, so we had cases, uh, for instance, where suppliers increased uh, prices uh, or their market up to 500%, you know, within a short space of time, a product in, in, in January, December was selling, uh, I'll make this example of a face mask where the product was selling for the one rent per box. Uh, by the time we got into the hard lockdown, the product was uh, 500 rent per box. So, you know, these are some of the problems that we picked up that there are insufficient control mechanisms, you know, particularly on the pricing aspect uh, that could um, uh, deal with some of these uh, inefficiencies. And we've had the tribunal uh, rule against uh, some of the uh, private sector players. Um, the case of the scam has largely been in the media. Uh, we've got another case, Babeleri, but there are several other cases that, in fact, we are coordinating with other structures. For instance, the SIU as part of the team that has been established by, by, by the president. So there are many, many areas of abuse that happened, uh, particularly on the pricing side, despite our interventions to say that the sector can collaborate to try and respond to the pandemic, but instead you know, some abuses in certain areas. I think uh, for now, uh, Mark, I'll leave it there. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mapato. So let me pick up from what you said. 
one of the things that the health market inquiry said is that there's a problem of what you call asymmetry what the health providers understand and what the people who use the health service understand is very very different and i i, I sense that that is also a factor in corruption because when you are talking about the conduct of the private healthcare sector this is no no comment on you but a lot of the language that you use is very hard for ordinary people to understand well am i being uh, uh uh ripped off you know you you talk for example about over servicing i know your your report uh talked about something that you called supplier induced uh demand uh which means that that the the provider of the healthcare services creates the demand rather than than the other way around um uh we hear of of cases where uh dr matudi uh medical practitioners uh write scripts i was told one example for example that instead of because uh uh depression is not a prescribed minimum benefit medical practitioners will write scripts for for bipolar disorder what i'd like you both to do is in 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 lay person's language tell us what corruption actually looks like how do i recognize this this thing called corruption and an unlawful behavior in your sector what is what's the line between bending rules and unlawful conduct that that is is corrupt okay yeah, th- thank you very much uh, uh, for that maybe before i launch into that i must say that in as much as we've talked about the recognized fraud and waste and abuse that has been reported on there's another there are other elements and i i saw somebody commenting in the chat about uh corruption that is happening within organizations for example there is still procurement fraud um when a scheme uh, maybe wins a contract was a trustee given a brown envelope now that happens but there is something that is unrecorded however i know on the siu roster there are some issues that are being investigated through the health sector anti corruption the the ifu schemes and also um some officials within the cms are under scrutiny they are doing lifestyle audits etc so we should not be blind to that sort of corruption happening it does happen in the sector now coming to exactly your your question around what does it look like to a common person so um the 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 bulk uh, of what we see is what we uh, uh, call um uh, uh, false claims now this would be uh claiming for services not rendered or claiming uh, for incorrect service or even changing the date for example and, I, and i'll tell you what common practices are there you find that medical aids run out and i think uh, mapato mentioned it uh, typically the third and last quarter there's no money left but a practitioner then continues seeing people and then they bank the consultations then come january they just start, start submitting the claims just changing the date and a lot of people think that it's not fraud because they went to the practitioner they got the service and maybe the practitioner is actually claiming the exact thing that they gave him but they changed the date that is fraud so you are misrepresenting the facts and somebody is going to be a prejudice and there is financial gain so then there are other practitioners who will just claim when there's no service rendered there are people walking around with backpacks full of money collecting medical aid numbers and then somebody sits and thus manufactures literally claims uh, there are others who will come in um, they are not sick they want a sick note and the doctor claims money and there are those who come in we call it an atm service for example a person says i don't have money can you give me 200 rand and then you claim against the medical so that falls under what you call false claims and then there's a big component around uh, coding mapato mentioned the, the the issue of over servicing for example um and in there there's a whole lot of things where people can change codes 
they do what they call unbundling of goods. So there's a procedure, you are going for a hip uh, uh, replacement, but, but there's one code for hip replacement, but the doctor can simply change um, everything that they do, opening of the, the muscle, incision on the skin, and then what they do, they bulk up the claim. And, and that's something that the, the member will not see but the medical aid will be able to see because they know uh, what it is. So those are just some of the, the examples that uh, uh, people can actually uh, look out for. Okay. Thank you. That, that's very helpful. My partner, would you, would you like to, to add? Yeah. Um, you know, I think one thing that we need to recognize is that healthcare is a very unique market. Um, you know, it's not uh, like a market for apples where you know exactly what you, you're purchasing. Uh, when you go to the doctor, you don't exactly know what you're purchasing. You're just not feeling well. And, you know, the power lies with the health professional to, you know, to diagnose you, to recommend appropriate treatment. So it's very difficult for consumers sometimes to to understand what they're purchasing. And as a result, they, you know, the, it opens the market up for, for abuse, particularly where you don't have, you know, ethical uh, providers who may you know, recommend services that are not necessary, uh, where they might, and you know, recommend care at a higher level than what's necessary. So, for instance, something that could be easily provided at a private health facility or a private health system, sorry, a primary health system, uh, you'd find that, you know, it's being elevated to tertiary level when it's not necessary to do so. A typical example that, uh, you know, we, 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 we always highlight is the cesarean section in South Africa. It's extremely high. One wonders whether, you know, is it necessary? Um, it, it, it is clinically uh, uh, required. And really the outcomes of that, what are the so those are some of the, the, the areas where it's very difficult to just the providers provide more services uh, uh, than necessary or interventions at higher levels of care than uh, what is necessary. But it's very difficult for consumers to, you know, to make the right choice because they don't know whether the service is necessary. And this is where the, the medical schemes have a role to play to act as an agent of consumers, you know, um, and I do believe uh, schemes are trying through, for instance, things such as pre-authorization, and I see a lot of interventions in terms of uh, driving primary health, uh, 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 primary health by schemes. But I think it's a very difficult uh, um, area for consumers, and this is where the schemes need to work in the best interest of the, the consumers. But there's also obvious abuses, such as the cases that I've mentioned, where you know prices are just extremely inflated, uh, without any any uh, justification of cost or you know anything where you would say that the that the price increase was warranted, so th those are some of the areas where I think yes there is corruption, but it's very difficult when you have a doctor a, a patient relationship because the patient is disempowered, doesn't have the necessary information you know to assess whether the service that's being provided is is appropriate. Thank you very much. Very helpful as well. You know, the definition of corruption, I was given this by Corruption Watch earlier on today, the abuse of entrusted power for private gain. And of course, in the health sector, we very much, particularly users of the healthcare sector, entrust, rely on trust when we go into, into the system. So if you talk about something like over-servicing, is that corruption? Because for me, it's, it, it's for private gain, it's an abuse of trust, it's, it's, it's providing services that are not necessary. Is that corruption? I, I ask because I think we need to call things by their real names as well. Mm -hmm. So if you go back to my, my opening remarks, is that we, we have adopted a stance where we have separated pure fraud which is criminal mm. and i think in the definition some definition of corruption they talk about dishonest or fraudulent behavior uh, um, and abuse of power now we have uh, uh, invoked these two other elements of waste and abuse where these are not criminal uh, uh, activities and uh, um, to to a lot of uh, large extent uh, there isn't an intention. It's it's somebody veering from uh, what is a, a appropriate uh, clinical practice, and that could be 
because of lack of knowledge. For example, uh, Mapad was talking about issues of coding, um, the fee, uh, the remuneration uh, structure, etc. It could be a structural problem that leads to uh, an untoward practice. So I would not necessarily label that as uh, corruption. We labeled as as wastage, uh, but it, it's inefficient uh, behavior. Also, would you would you like to add? Yes, um, I mean, you know, you mentioned uh, supply and juice demand. It was a very difficult uh, concept that we had to deal with because some of it is just driven by practitioners who are just cautious, you know, um, you know, treating more than necessary because um, they just want the best outcomes for their for their patient. It's, it's not intentional. But also you have a, a part of it which is driven by consumers themselves, you know, um, I want my child to share the same birthday as me, I say Julian, and necessary Caesar and section. So there are many such dynamics where I say, yes, there is overutilization, but sometimes, you know, the, the, the line is not clear. Uh, you've got practitioners, and, and, and we, we got a lot of this from, I think, um, the OBs and the gynecologists who say they're subject to high litigation, uh, you know, these days. And as, as a result, they need to be very cautious on how they treat. And maybe those are some of the things that might drive up utilization. But as I said, there's outright fraud, there's outright abuse of the system, there's excessive pricing than what's necessary. And I think we need to focus on those. But the structural reforms that we need is the, to deal with some of those unintentional, you know, uh, utilization. In, uh, that is in the system. And, and the structural reforms that you think are needed are set out in the report on the health market inquiry, which currently seems to be going nowhere. But but I don't I'm ask struggling you, to hear you, Mark. Sorry. I, I yeah, said that okay. the structural reforms that are needed, some of them are set out in the report of the health market inquiry, which uh, was I think came out 18 months ago, but we haven't seen a great deal of, uh, of movement on. Let me just say something before we move on uh, again. You know, I noticed one comment in the chat that this conversation is, is one-sided. I wasn't quite sure what, what was meant by that, but I do want to say that you know, we understand that the vast majority of medical aids, of providers in the private healthcare sector are honest, but there is a problem of corruption and mm. fraud. And as uh, Dr. Matudi said, it is very, very costly. And therefore, we have to shine the same spotlight that we do on public sector corruption into this corner of private healthcare sector corruption. Which leads to my next question. Uh, and it, again, it's to both of you. Who are the regulators who should be looking into this and preventing it? And what do we do when, for example, we know that there are corruption in the regulators, that the SIU is investigating the HPCSA, the Health Professions Council of South Africa. I think there's an investigation into the council <laughs> medical teams. Who is meant to be stopping this and, and, and watching this and, and monitoring this? Uh, first to you, Dr. Mutudi. So my, 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 my short answer would be it's everybody's responsibility, whether you are a funder, a regulator, professional body. But there should be people who drive this. And that's the question that we need to agree on. Should it be your Council for Medical Aid Schemes whose main function is to play oversight on schemes? Maybe not, uh, because uh, then they cannot look at healthcare practitioners. Should it be HPCSA? Maybe to some extent, but they're not looking at pharmacists or nurses or um, other practitioners. So there is a need for broader collaboration. And, and as I say, it's everybody's business. Um, and, and what we've adopted from our side is that fraud, corruption, whatever you name it, should not be an area that we compete on, we should collaborate on. So we share strategies, we share data, we share information so that we give the fraudsters very little chance to move around. Because typically what will happen is that um, somebody will hit gems, for example, um, and once gems is uh, wiser to their methods, they move on to the next scheme, maybe discovery them. So, but if we share information, if gems were to say, 
in January, this is what I've seen. And that information is shared with everyone. And then uh, uh, we, we are able to move some way to cabin. The second part is that we need partnership with uh, law enforcement entities so that when we have found these uh, corrupt practices, we do not just become law unto ourselves, but are able to, ha- to invoke the right consequence management uh, processes. And what typically what happens, and, and medical aid schemes have been found wanting, and if you follow the discussions in the Section 59 uh, investigation, for example, that you become the investigator, the judge, and the jury, and then you also then want to recoup uh, money uh, without implementing other uh, resolution uh, practices that are relevant. So we need broader uh, collaboration and, and include the law enforcement. The third element to that is that we need to then train one another of our own environment. I mean, Mopato mentioned that healthcare is very complex. Um, um, so if you are going to have maybe a prosecutor who's not au fait uh, with what's happening in uh, the, the health industry and they get a thick docket, it will gather dust because they do not necessarily have the interest or the energy or the know-how to do that. And, and there must be this uh, information transmit among the, the entities. And once we start doing this, uh, from the professional body side, and I'm, I'm happy there's a, a colleague here from Ireland, Neil Kamina, who presented at one of our seminars, I think, uh, last year, who talked about the importance of peer review. And that's the role of the professional bodies to start saying, as orthopedic surgeons, as cardiologists, you have your own people who are then looking at the work that you are doing, and they can do He talked about what you call a nudge factor. And their study was able to demonstrate that just having peer review was able to reduce over over servicing by about 40 percent in certain areas so just to recap it's everybody's business and there are certain drivers uh, that need to collaborate uh, on all fronts and and is it are you seeing promising signs that this collaboration is beginning to happen because at the beginning you you know you mentioned the research that showed the problem of fraud is in fact escalating. Mm. Uh, uh, is, is there this collaboration that you said would be be so helpful? Is it happening in South Africa? Definitely, it's starting to happen, Mark. And I, and I can tell you about HFMU. Uh, HFMU, the Health Forensic Man- uh, Management Unit that is run by the BHF, does not just cater for BHF members. We've got non-BHF health funders that are involved. We've even got the banking industry involved. We've got the insurance industry. And right now, we, we are involved also in the SIU's health sector anti-corruption forum. So it's still early days, but we are starting to see the, uh, that collaboration happening. I think what is still remaining is on the consequence management side. And I think earlier you said, why are we not seeing test cases? You see, one, I think there was a report recently of a a pharmacist in the uh, East Rand, for example, who um, defrauded James to something like 12 million rand, and they were successfully processed. But those cases are few and far between. We need to see large-scale collaboration that will lead to fruits. And another example, we saw about, uh, um, uh, I think about six months ago, a doctor in the Eastern Cape who um, was uh, uh, found to be writing fraudulent sick notes. Now, this did not come from medical aid schemes, but it came from employers in the area who were complaining about sick leave uh, challenges. We then took the doctor through our system and found that they were also getting, uh, uh, they were hitting the schemes hard. The third example, you, you also are aware of our efforts around ROPS or remunerative work around, outside the public sector. We're doing a lot of work with the SIU now we are, we are starting to match data from the schemes and the provinces. And we are seeing providers who are in full-time employment are claiming to see 50 patients in the private sector on a daily basis. That, that can't be correct. Now, had we not looked at exchange of data, we would not be any wiser. And, uh, and those are early, early steps, but I think those are uh, good results to actually start building one. Thank you very much. Mapato, would you, would you like to add? 
Yes, Mark. I mean, I, I fully agree that collaboration is starting to happen. It's very important. But I feel as well that, you know, some of the interventions that we are having are very reactive. We, we, we need to inform the system so that we, we, we avoid these things from happening in the first place. I mentioned the HMI report talks about, you know, reforming the price determination system, dealing with the, the, the outdated account coding and the unbundling issues coming up with treatment protocols that would, you know, some of those interventions would avoid even this conduct happening. So for instance, we said that around pricing, let's establish a forum that will uh, set maximum prices for PMBs. It's one intervention that can cap abuses. We, we, we recommended that we adopt risk sharing models between funders and, 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 and providers, right? Those are the structural reforms that are required to curb the abuse. As much as the collaboration is happening, as much as we have these, in, these investigations that are ongoing, I feel without proper reforms of the healthcare system to enable you know, certain uh, uh, regulatory uh, uh, mechanisms around these issues, we will continue to have the same problem. And it's not only on the supply side. I feel as well on the demand side or the, on the funder side, there needs to be proper reform. There are over 80 medical schemes, 120 uh, benefit uh, uh, packages. A consumer can't compare the two. You don't know whether you're getting value for money or not. You know, we said that let's come up with a basic benefit package that any consumer can package has, you know, a comprehensive services. You can compare between med scheme, discovery and the other parties. But at this point in time, we can't do that. And these are the inefficiencies that are enabling some of the abuse. We recommended that the CMS strengthen the the accountability mechanisms, particularly on the administrator side, you know, who they are managing schemes and uh, monies, but they're not really accountable to scheme members. We recommend that they increase accountability that the trustees, the principal officers, even the administrators, they hold um, the provider side accountable and they purchase a, a you know, value-based uh, services uh, on behalf of the consumer. Because in this area, a consumer is really disempowered. But now they're paying for these services, they're middle parties, and one doesn't understand where they fit in in terms of trying to assist the consumer. So I, I, I really, really want to emphasize that structural reforms are necessary in the private sector. And that's, yes, we can continue to collaborate on these investigations, but let's avoid being reactive and just Im implement proper uh, uh, regulatory systems. Thanks, Mark. Thank you very much. I mean, it seems to me that there's so many ideas that could work. And I think what frustrates members of the public is when we know what needs to be done, why is it not happening? Is there no, is there no political will to address this, this corruption when, the, when there are simple measures that can be taken? And, and let me throw another question at you. You know, we, we keep on talking about the users of the of the healthcare system, the consumers of, of healthcare. To what extent are they involved? To what extent, uh, Dr. Matudi, does the Board of Healthcare Funders reach out and advertise and, and educate members of the public about what is fraudulent behavior, what is lawful, what is unlawful? To what extent do you actually encourage uh, medical aid scheme members to report uh, 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 doctors and specialists if there are, are, are problems. That's one partnership that you haven't really talked about, one collaboration that I think perhaps you need to give a bit more thought to. What, 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 what's your thoughts on that? Yeah, Mark, I think you raise a very important question. I mean, certainly there's very little that comes from uh, professional bodies to the end user. Um, even from uh, the, the councils, because their, their motto is to protect the beneficiaries or members' interests. There are some roadshows that are happening, um, but I'm not sure as far as the reach uh, that uh, um, um, is intended, whether it's successful or not. We have also um, tried to run some campaigns uh, to educate people about benefits. But I want to latch on to what uh, Mabad was saying uh, earlier around the complexity of the system. Um, for as long as we have, in fact, it's more than 300 benefit options in the public, uh, in the 78 schemes. Even I've been in the sector for quite a while, I don't understand all the benefits and I've been here. So imagine the beneficiary who has got no idea about what healthcare is. So 
we need to be serious about the structural uh, uh, changes um, that uh, need to, to happen. The HMI highlighted some of these, but there are other moving parts. Uh, you've got um, the NHI debate happening. You've got the low-cost benefit option uh, discussion uh, happening. You've got the conduct of financial uh, uh, institutions bill that is happening. Now, from a policy level, it's quite complex, and you might even find some uh, policy incoherence elements. So from, from a government, a regulatory point of view, we need to make sure that we start speaking with one voice so that we do not cause confusion in the industry. Otherwise, we will be able to cascade the right sort of information uh, to, to the end user. Secondly, the, 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 the funders, I think they need to have stronger relationships uh, with uh, not just practitioners, but also with the beneficiaries. Uh, it cannot be correct that the only contact is when you collect the premium or when there's a complaint that we must be deliberate about saying, this is what the medical aid scheme is about. These are our benefits. These are our processes. This is what uh, 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 are bottlenecks in the system. I saw a comment uh, 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 earlier about saying that it's the industry that is at fault because of the complexity, benefits are depleted. But I think it's also time that the industry is able to say benefits are depleted because there's a structural problem, which is a legal problem. You've got a PMB problem that needs to be sorted out. And as a result, you don't have much wiggle room uh, to actually change uh, certain things. So um, there, there needs to be a lot more that's going to be done at all levels, schemes, uh, government regulators and the professional bodies. Thank you. Uh, Mvoyisi just comments, and I'll ask this to you, Mapato. Why is there no hospital groups focus? Uh, um, they have what they call premises fee, that is a lot of, of, of money. Is there a problem in these big uh, three or four groups of private hospitals uh, as well when we come to fraud and corruption? Um. Look, I think one of the, the main problem that we found with the hospital groups was the just high level of concentration, um, uh, you know, accounted for by the big three, uh, you know, using beds and admission rates, they account for 80% of the market. So that on its own, it's, it's a particular problem. But the overutilization problem that we talk about in the HMI report is a function of the relationship between the doctors in the hospital groups and some there are somewhat incentives between the two you know the two the two parties that we think that are the ones that drive over utilization so there are certain incentives that were provided to to practitioners to practice at particular hospitals and that relationship, although, as I say, you know, SI, uh, supply and use demand is very, it's something very difficult to prove, but uh, we, 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 we did some assessment of some of the incentives and we thought with these existing incentives, it's very easy for utilization to, to happen in hospital uh, because of the relationship between the, 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 the big three and the, uh, the, the, the practitioners. Um, I'm not sure what is referred to by the, the fee there, um, I, I don't know whether it's what's required uh, uh, by hospitals uh, uh, from the from the practitioners. I'm, I really am not sure what that refers to, but I think the main problem here is the over uh, concentration, but as well the inequity in terms of distribution of facilities. And this one is a function of the licensing system, where you see the licensing system prefers, you know, a, a establishment of facilities in metropolitan areas. And as a result, you've got an oversupply of facilities there. And when there is an oversupply of facilities, there will definitely be overutilization. So those are some of the things that I think we need to address with regard to the hospital side. Thank you. I, I'll just read a comment that I got on my, my WhatsApp, uh, and I wonder if you'd agree with it. Um, uh, it says, top-down corruption largely arises from the structure of the system, which allows a few large players to create rules of the game that institutionalize conflicts of interest. Corruption then becomes legal. The CC doesn't use this language. Instead, it frames the systemic failure as market failure rather than corruption. It comes to the same thing, though. 
Would would you agree with that, Mapato? <laughs> I would. I mean, I would. I would. Um, if some of the terminology that we use is because it was in the in the act. So the act would refer to price fixing, collusion, and all of that. But you know, um, when you go deeper into it, um. It is it is corruption. I mean, it, it is taking away from the public, so it can only be uh, corruption. But as I said, some of the things are driven by consumers themselves. They're driven by, you know, practitioners that are cautious. So um, we need to be very careful with the terminology that we use. But there are certain abuses that are just plain corruption, despite the the language that we might be using um, in, in in our in in, you know, in our environment. Thank you. Thank you. Well, thank you very much to both of you. Unfortunately, as I said, the hour goes fairly quickly. Um, what we've tried to do today, I mean, it's, as, as you both said, it's a very complex, multi-layered area, area. And I think what we've tried to do is just flush out some of the issues for further debate and discussion and public awareness. Um, is there anything you would like to say in conclusion as your kind of takeaway comments about how how we should all be dealing with this 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 crisis uh, of, of private sector corruption and the way as you started out by saying Mapato at the very beginning it it has its implications for the health system as a whole which is particularly important in the period in which we're talking about about national health insurance so Dr Matudi I'll I'll start with you uh, then I'll come to Mapato and then I'm afraid it'll be time up and we'll have to wrap up for the day Dr Matudi yeah I want to say that, uh, I mean, uh, corruption exists. Um, uh, not every practitioner or trustee or executive is corrupt. In fact, there are a few bad apples. But the impact uh, of these corrupt activities, even if it's co uh, conducted by a few people, has got a telling impact on our ability to give a care. The 6 or 10 or 15 percent of our expenditure that is consumed by these practices should have gone to healthcare services. And that's why we are so serious about it. And I think often people think that uh, we're trying to lynch practitioners or um, suppliers, etc. We're just saying that it's a serious thing, needs to be dealt with because it takes away from the uh, uh, end user. Thank you, Mark. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Matudi. Uh, uh, over to you, Mapato. Um, uh, I just want to conclude by saying that um, the HMI conducted a very comprehensive analysis of the private sector and uh, we highlighted several areas of reform. But importantly, as we move towards the NHI, um, it's very critical that uh, these reforms are implemented. Um, a very properly uh, regulated private sector will only benefit the state as a purchase of services. Um, so reforming the incentives in the sector, in the private sector, is a really necessary step uh, towards a successful uh, NHI implementation. And I think the, 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 the need for an integrated system for me came out very clearly now uh, during COVID-19. So these reforms are very critical. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Uh, for your excellent uh, contributions and helpful contributions this evening. Thank you very much to all the participants. Uh, you've put a lot of comments in the chat, and all of those comments are very, very helpful, I think, to the BHF, to the Competition Commission, but also to members of the Health Sector Anti-Corruption Forum who are looking for tips and clues and ideas about where corruption occurs and how to tackle it. So it's all very, very uh, helpful and, and much appreciated. I'm sorry that we have run out of time. I'd just like to say uh, in closing uh, that next week, uh, we will, at the same time, next Sunday, we will have the last of these webinars this year, but it's going to be an important one again uh, because this time we will be joined by, the, uh, uh, by Shamila Batoy, uh, everybody knows from the NPA, uh, Gen General Godfrey Labea from the Hawks, and advocate Andy Motibi, uh, the head of the Special Investigating Unit. So we've got the top people uh, to come and account at the end of a year in which corruption in health has come very much to public attention and public concern. And I think that will be a webinar where we can hear what progress is, where we can ask questions and hopefully 
where we can get some momentum to go into 2021 uh, cleaning this up, mess up. I should also say that in the course of next week, the Auditor General of South Africa on Wednesday will be providing the second report on corruption in relation to COVID-19 uh, funds. So that too will provide, I think, an important platform for next week's discussion. So Mapato, Dr. Motudi, Corruption Watch, who helped put this together, the SIU, who are incredibly helpful, and to you who've joined us on a Sunday evening, thank you for what I hope has been uh, a useful uh, primer and introduction to this discussion of private health sector corruption. Good night and stay safe. Thank you. Bye-bye. Good night. Good night. Bye.